John 17. The book of John is a wonderful book. Praise the Lord. Yes, it is. Came from John himself. Not the John that wrote the book, but the John that is in the house. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, so we're in John chapter 17. We're going to talk about today oneness with Christ and his body. Oneness with Christ and his body. So in John chapter 17, verse 11, it says, And now I am no more in the world. This is Jesus. Actually, there's a prayer of Jesus in John 17. He's talking to the Father. He says, And now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one As we are one. Holy Father. So this is Jesus' prayer to the Father. Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. It's a pretty powerful prayer, isn't it? There's much more to the prayer. We'll read a little bit more of it. But his prayer was that they would be one even as we are one. And the only way that that could occur is that God would work in their lives to do that. And so we're going to see, of course, uh, through the New Covenant, through the New Testament, and uh, uh, primarily in the epistles, you see that we are a body of Christ, a uh, body of that is joined together and knitted together, and God has made us one body in Christ. Praise the Lord. So he, he's praying that God the Father would keep them. He would keep them. Thank God. God says that we're in the palm of his hand. He says that we're engraved in the palm of his hand. He said he's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before the presence of him, his glory with exceeding joy. Praise God. He says that he's able to save us to the uttermost, those that come unto him by Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is making intercession for us. Praise the Lord. So God's keeping us. How many are glad God's keeping us? Hallelujah. Not only does he give us life and uh, give us eternal life and give us a relationship with himself, but he's preserving us. He keeps us. And one of the prayers is in... uh, In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he said that God would sanctify us wholly, preserve us in our whole spirit, soul, and body. Hallelujah. Preserve us. Well, that means he's going to keep us. Amen? So God is keeping us. God is preserving us. How many are thankful today for his preservation in your life? Thank God in so many ways and more ways than we know. God has preserved our life. Amen? So he says that I want you to make them one, even as we, I and the Father, are one. Now skip down with me. Not that it's not all good. It's all good reading, but we're just going to skip down to verse 20 of the same chapter. In John 17, 20, he says, Neither pray I for these alone. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Think about this. Jesus says, I'm not just praying for these that have been my disciples and followers and closely related uh, followers. Uh, I'm praying also for those who shall believe on me through their word. Well, if you consider that, everybody in the kingdom of God, everybody in the body of Christ has received Jesus and believed on Jesus because of their word. The word that they preached and went from one generation to the next generation and the word that is written that we have in our Bible, it is a word that came from them by the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so all of us have believed on Jesus in one sense through their word. So Jesus is actually covering the whole body of Christ in his prayer now. And there are numerous scriptures that tell us that Jesus not only prayed this intercessory prayer on the earth, but he also is interceding in heaven. 
So I'm sure that part of his prayer in heaven is that we would be one as he is one. That God would keep us and preserve us and that we would be one as the Father and the Son Jesus are one. So I'm praying for those that shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one. So he's praying the same prayer. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That's a pretty strong request here he's making. That they would be one, Father, as, the, as you are in me and I am in thee. That they also may be one in us. So he's really praying uh, the result of his death and resurrection. He's praying that they would be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So he's praying that they would be one in us. And how did that occur? Jesus Christ came to this earth. He came to this earth to minister. And he uh, came to destroy the works of, of the devil. That's part of his ministry was just to destroy the works of the devil and heal people compassionately uh, set them free. God uh, sent Jesus to do that. He was anointed, what? To preach the gospel so that he was preaching the gospel to the poor, setting at liberty them that are bound, right? So Jesus came to set people free. That was what he's, uh, he was anointed to do, preach the gospel and set the captives free, and that's what he did in all of his ministry. But then he had... One of his primary, or we'll say his primary purpose for coming was to die and to be raised again and go through the uh, penalty for our sin, suffer the penalty for our sin and to die in our place and to give his life. But God then justified us through his death and through his resurrection. We've been justified and life has been made available through Jesus Christ, anyone who would believe. And so now he's praying in advance for those who would believe on him that they would be one in us us praise God one in us and what was his purpose in praying that that the world may believe that thou hast sent me so our being one in Christ our being united to Christ and then one with each other united to one another then that is a testimony to the world that Jesus Christ really did come and the impact on the world is that we really do love each other. Hallelujah. That they would believe, those in the world would believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory, verse 22, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. God has put some of that glory on you. The glory of God, the presence and the power of God rest on the church. The glory which thou gavest me, I've given them that they may be one even as we are one. That they may be one, united together as one, even as we are one. And then he goes further in verse 23, says, I in them and thou in me. So I'm in them, and you're in me, that they may be made perfect in one. So Jesus said, I'm going to be in them, and you're going to be in me. In other words, God the Father, the Scripture says, I and the Father will come and make our abode with you. I and the Father will come and live on the inside of you. Thank you, Jesus. So Jesus and the Father have come to make their home inside of you. Your body is referred to as the temple of God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, walk in them. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. So God has come to live on the inside of you. Christ has come to live on the inside of you. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of, hope of glory. 
What did he just say? He said, I have given them this glory that you've given me. So there's a glory. And what does uh, the book of Romans say in chapter 3? It says that you were predestinated, you were called, you were justified, and then you were glorified. So then God has predestined he's planned for you and then he called you out of darkness and then hallelujah you were justified you received the justification by faith and you received the glory of God God put his glory in you and on you praise God forever hallelujah to Jesus this is bigger than we know Hallelujah to Jesus. I am them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. That thou hast sent me. And hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Man, this is amazing. That thou hast loved me has loved them as thou hast loved me. Well, really, the proof of that is that God so loved the world, the proof of his love for the world, but the devil tries to blind people from the love of God. Why? Because if they're blinded to the love of God, then they're not going to receive Jesus. But if their eyes are open to the love of God and they see what Jesus has done for them, they're going to want him. They're going to desire him. They're going to, and and as a Christian, the more we see God's love for us, the more we desire to follow him, the more we desire to serve him because he loves us. He loves us with, uh, the scripture says, an everlasting love. Hallelujah. A love that just don't quit. A love that just don't give up on you. A love that loves you when you're down. A love that loves you when you're bound. A love that loves you when you don't know what to do. When you didn't take the right direction you didn't do the right thing God still loved you through your mess how many are glad for that today God loves the world God so loved the world but he loves you as a believer and he loves you just like he loves Jesus Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. hallelujah to Jesus thou hast loved them as you have loved me So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So this this love of God was manifested through his giving of his son that he actually did send him. And he actually did send him to deliver people. And he actually did send him. It was how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing what all that were oppressed of the devil. So it was God that anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost. So God is involved in everything. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I'm not doing the works, the works that I do. The Father that dwells in me, he doeth the works. In other words, all glory went back to the Father God. Jesus lived in that manner, in that way. He gave the glory to God, the Father. And so Jesus did that because God sent him to do that. Praise God. But the crowning of that was of what God sent him to do was his death and his burial and his resurrection and his ascension and his seating at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus Christ did all of that so that we could all be one even as he and the Father are one and that we could be one together in him. Jesus said, in us. One in us. Hallelujah to Jesus. Glory to God. Father, I will that they also, verse 24, whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. Father, I want all of these that you've given to me to be with me. Where I, am, where I am, that they may behold my glory. Glory. 
So God didn't want to just save us down here. He wants us there. Hallelujah. He wants us to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. God wants us in heaven. Hallelujah. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And the way you know. Thomas said, we don't know the way. He said, I am the way. That's the scripture we're using on that billboard. I am the way, John 14 and 6. I am the what? Way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through me. So Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I am the way. I am the way. Hallelujah. (laughs) Glory to God. So he told the clear way to heaven. He told the clear way to eternal life. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He didn't say, I am a truth. He didn't say, I am a life. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. He is a way to the Father. And there is no other way to get to the Father except through him. So Jesus made the way clear, hallelujah, uh, to his disciples. But he also made the way clear through his death and resurrection. He made the way for all of us to be able to come to God through faith in Jesus Christ and have what? The life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he is the way to the Father. He's the truth that's going to show you the Father, and he is the life when you believe the truth. Hallelujah. When you believe on Jesus, then you're going to receive eternal life. And eternal life is what prepares you for heaven. Hallelujah. And heaven is your eternal home. We're here for just a little short time. Life is like a vapor. It appears for a little time, and then it vanishes away. It's just here for a short period of time. We're like strangers passing through, Hebrew says. We're not. This is not our home. We may have a nice home, a nice place to live and we're thankful to God for his goodness and grace but it's not our real home hallelujah it's not our eternal home our eternal home is heaven heaven is a real place where God the father lives and Jesus lives hallelujah and all who believe on him when they die they go to that place called heaven hallelujah and they go into his presence and he wants them to see His glory. He wants them to see his glory. That they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. So God so loved the world. But he loved you before the foundation of the world. Because God chose you in him. I said, God chose you in him before the foundation of the world. So you were chosen, hallelujah, by God in Christ before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah. You were chosen in him that you would be able to be without blame before him in love. In other words, he loved you so much that he chose you and he planned a plan so that you and I could come to God and we could have this relationship with God and we could have favor with God and we could have friendship with God we could be reconciled to God and we could have this love of God toward us and we could have this love of God in us the same love that God has for us he has also put in us hallelujah to Jesus praise God forever You loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known thee, that thou hast sent me. The world doesn't know you, but these know you, and they know that you sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. 
the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. The love wherewith thou say, uh, glory to God. Hallelujah to Jesus. The love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So when Jesus came in, he brought his love with him. Eternal life is actually God's life. Life as God has it. So when eternal, eternal life comes in your spirit, it changes your spirit into a new creature in Christ, a new creation in Christ, a workmanship of God in Christ. You are in union with Christ. And so what's in him came into you. The life that is in Christ, the life that is in Jesus or in God came into you. And within this life are, de- are different things like love. The fruit of the Spirit comes out of this life. Love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and meekness and temperance and faith. It all comes out of this life. Which is in you. Remember, you can have a lot of it or you can have less of it. In other words, you're born again. You have eternal life. That's one measure of life. When you get eternal life, just saved. You're born again. You got life on the inside of you. You can have some more of it. You can get filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. You have a greater measure of it. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit, just like the word in the book of Acts. And Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of life. So uh, in John 4, he talked about salvation like a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And now he talks about a river of this life. So there's more water flowing in a river than it's coming out of a well. Are you with me? So, so you get an increased measure of this uh, life when you get filled with the Holy Spirit. So both of them enable you to love. Hallelujah. Enable you to walk in the peace of God, the joy of the Lord. Love, joy, peace, patience. Be patient. Hallelujah. Love, joy, peace, patience, joy. Praise God. So the fruit of the Spirit is a result of the life of God coming on the inside of you. But it's like anything that's in you, it needs to be coming out of you. And you develop in it. And you grow in it. Amen. You can increase in the love of God. Paul's prayer. There's more than one prayer where Paul's praying that there would be an increase in love. Right? What does Ephesians 3 say? It says that we are to, it's instruction from the Apostle Paul. He's praying it. It's an inspired prayer. So if he's praying it, it's just like Ephesians 1, we ought to be praying it. Why? Because it's an inspired prayer in the Word of God. So it's a good prayer for you to pray. It's a guaranteed prayer. (laughs) If you don't know what to pray, pray the scripture. All right, pray what Jesus prayed. Pray what Paul prayed. All right, so then he said, I'm praying, Father, that you would strengthen, strengthen the church, strengthen us with might by your spirit in our inner man, that the Holy Spirit would strengthen us with mighty power by the Holy Spirit in our inner man. That Christ would dwell in our hearts, that we would be rooted, rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend with all the saints, rooted and grounded in love. So it's like this, this love has roots that go into God. Hallelujah. Rooted and grounded in love and able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the what? Breath. The length, the depth, the height, the dimensions of God's love. Uh, He says that you would know what is the breadth, length, depth, and height, and know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. In other words, you would have some experience of love that you can't fully understand. 
Hallelujah. You can't fully comprehend with your brain. Hallelujah. This is Holy Spirit stuff. This is God stuff. This is stuff that your brain doesn't always figure out. You can't figure out everything in the Bible with your brain. You can't, you can't reason through the Bible with your brain. You have to go in there and say, Holy Spirit, you're my God. You're my teacher. I need some help here. I need God's help. I need your Holy Spirit guidance. I need you to teach me. I don't want to read the Bible without the Holy Spirit. I want him to teach me. Praise God. So, Holy Spirit, I need you to teach me. Rooted and grounded in love. Able to comprehend with all the saints. What is the breadth? With all the what? Saints. The believers. What is the breadth, length, depth, and height? To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Hallelujah. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That you would be filled up. And he's talking about the saints. He's not just talking about one believer. But we can be filled with the fullness of God. God's life. God's love. The fullness of God. God is love. God and love are not something. It's not like a, a tag on God. God is love. Just like God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. God is love and in him is no death and darkness. No hatred. God loves. That's what he is, a love being. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Are you with me? Thank God. So what does he say again? I'm going to say it. Read it from the scripture. Verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. So when Jesus came into you, his love, nature, came on the inside of you. I said, when Jesus came into you, his love, nature, came on the inside of you. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. All right, let's go to 1 John. Now, this John that wrote the Gospel of John also wrote the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. All right, we're in uh, John chapter 4, and there's a lot about love in the Gospel of John and a lot about love in the epistles of John as well. We can't teach the whole book right now, so we're just looking at a few scriptures. If you're in John chapter 4, we're going to begin reading with verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. I said, everyone that loveth is born of God. Hallelujah. So his admonition to us, his beloved talking to us. Well, that's an an endearing name, isn't it? He calls you his beloved. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Is anybody warm in here besides me? human means we need more air conditioning. (laughs) We're not used to humidity, are we? But how many thank God for the rain? Praise the Lord. I know it makes a mess, but it sure helps us. We, We need the rain. Praise the Lord. Beloved, so he talks to you in this way. Beloved, you're his beloved. Let us love one another. For love is of God. Love is of God. It comes out of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. It's one of the places it says God is love. 
So this is what he is or who he is. He is love. All right, verse 9, it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So this verse to me is just like wonderful. It's like John 3.16. We could quote John 3.16 every day for the rest of your life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. What would that do for you? Well, it would do a lot for you because you'd see how much he loved you because you're part of the world. But it would enlarge your vision that there's somebody in your, in your path today. Every day, there's somebody in your path. Wherever you go, there's somebody in your path that needs Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that God loved them. Yes. All right, let's go to verse 9 again. This, and this was manifested, the love of God toward us. This is God's love manifested toward us. So his love is coming out toward us, and we have just read that his love would be in us. His love is toward us before it is in us. I said his love is toward us before it is in us. So this is the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live or that we might have life through him. Does it make you want to shout or something? You know, uh, Just pause and think about it. You could sit here for the next 30 minutes and meditate on that. Thank you, Lord. We don't have the time here, so you go home. Do that. Do that on your way home. All right, verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation is a a word that most people don't like. What does that mean? Uh, It's like he was the atoning sacrifice that made mercy available to you and I. In some places, it's translated mercy seat. So, this is God's way of wrapping his arms around the whole human race and loving them to himself. Here in his love, not that God We love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If God loved us this much, and God didn't love you when you had it together. No, he loved you this much. When you were lost, without God, without hope in the world, he loved you this much, no matter what kind of sin you're involved in. God loved you this much, no matter what position of life you were in, what kind of degrading thing you were involved in. What, no matter what, God loved you. Hallelujah. So how much more? If God loved us this much, we ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. In other words, while we're loving each other, our love is perfected. While we're acting out 
acting on the love of God. You don't always act on the love of God when you feel it. You act on the love of God because it's the Word of God. Amen. Well, if you feel it, that's wonderful. If you don't feel it, go ahead and act like it anyway. Why? Because it's the truth. It's the will of God that you walk in love. You don't always have the same emotions in every situation, but if you'll walk in love, if you'll say, I'm going to love that person and I'm going to believe in that person. The love believes the best of every person. So I'm going to believe in them, even though they're messed up right now, it seems like they're off track even perhaps. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for the mercy of God that loves us so much. No matter what we do, thank God for the blood of Jesus and the mercy of God. And he reaches out to us and that's the body of Christ. We are to reach out to one another and help one another out of their problem, out of their dilemma, out of their sin maybe, out of their darkness out of their hopelessness, out of their defeat, out of their... No, don't condemn them. Say, what's wrong with you? No. You're there to lift them up. You're there to encourage them. You're there to support them. You're there to lift up their arms, lift up their hands. You're there to strengthen them, to be a strength to them. God has called you and created you to be somebody that will reach out to somebody else, not just to the world, and reach out to the world with the gospel. And that we have encouraged over and over again. But we got to reach one another and love one another. You see somebody missing, somebody's not in the house. Nobody, you know, listen, if your children don't come, them home, uh, you go looking for them. I mean, people, if, the, if their dog is lost, they'll spend all night looking for them. Come on. They'll be searching throughout the neighborhood. You know, we had somebody, their dog got lost and uh, came to our house, came to our front door. So we opened the door. The dog came in. Because we're trying to help, you know, it's a dog. He's obviously in the wrong place. He don't belong to us. He's not my dog. and don't plan to keep him. But open the door. He came in, just act like he was at the house. You know, then we found the, uh, the number on the tag there, so we have something to identify. So if you have a dog, put a tag on them. Or put a chip in them. But I can't read your chip. Right? Take them somewhere else to get, know what the chip says. Right, Maylene? So uh, put a tag on them. So we got this dog in the house. We called the number. Sure enough. His wife is in one vehicle running all over the town, you know, running, uh, the neighborhood, you know. And he's in another vehicle, so they're just doing their best to find this dog. So we find out the dog, and so we told him where the dog is. We got the dog. So it was in less than 10 minutes, they were at our house. And got the dog connected with them again. So they can take their dog home. (laughs) Right? Their dog. Not our dog. Their dog. But I'm just saying, if people will look for a dog. Dog on it? Come on. You need to look for the people. (laughs) You need to look for the people. If you don't see them, say, where are they? They got God's chip in them. Praise the Lord. So they're identifiable. They belong to the body of Christ. And if they belong to this church, in other words, they're part of this church, and we want to know where they're at. So the body needs to be looking for them. Not just the pastor's. No, the body needs to be looking for them because they're not in-house in the church. Are you with me? What are you doing by doing that? You're just loving them. You're loving them. Who knows what it is? We don't know. Well, that dog couldn't hear well. So they're out there calling the dog, but they know that the dog can't hear. So the dog's lost, and he can't hear. That's a bad position for the dog. 
So thank God we opened the door and let the dog in the house. So some dogs are lost in, you know, like some people are lost from other churches. We got to let them in the house. If they come into this house, praise the Lord, we want to welcome them. If, if they need to get back to their own church, that's great. But come on, we need to welcome them no matter where they came from. We need to welcome them in the house. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. What are we doing? We're just loving the sheep that are straight away. Praise God. So if they're in this house, we need to be looking for them. Or a part of this house. Hallelujah. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We know that we dwell in him because he's given us his Holy Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. God sent his Son. Say that again. God sent his Son. Hallelujah. Say that again. God sent his Son. That the world, that was Jesus' prayer. That the world may know that thou hast sent me. And he didn't just send him for no purpose. He sent him to save the world, praise God. So we want them to know. We want the people at your job to know that God sent Jesus. We want people to know when you go to Walmart. We want people to know at Walmart. We want people to know at the, at the uh, department store or Target or Starbucks. Some of you go every day. And you see their face every day. They may have a lot of turnover, but you know, you're going to see somebody's face. Giving you that coffee. Giving you your kick. You need to give them something to track. The love of God. Amen. So when you do that, what are you doing? You're just letting people know that God sent Jesus. God sent Jesus. Jesus.